All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, welcome to HIPAA Audits with Espresso. What should you expect? We are uh, broadcasting from Belo Horizonte, Brazil this time, so I hope everybody can hear. We don't experience any um, technical difficulties. Um, my name is Carlos Leva. I'm CEO of Three Lines Publishing, publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide. I'm also the attorney, attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Uh, our director of operations for uh, um, Three Lines Publishing, Martin Gwynn, is the moderator. He'll be uh, looking at the chat uh, window for questions. We take questions as we go. Uh, we actually like uh, questions as we go. It's more uh, interactive that way. We also will take questions at the end. So with that, um, let's one of the things about preparing for an audit is you need to have um, your preparation should be comprehensive. So we're going to talk about what 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 is a comprehensive HIPAA compliance initiative. What what does that look like? And, and especially especially in light of the fact that when it comes to HIPAA compliance, uh, 20 years out after the the rules have been promulgated, there's still a lot of mystery around uh, you know what organizations should be doing to comply. Okay, and there are partial solutions. There are people that help you with a risk assessment, people that can help you with training, people that can help you with these odds and ends, but how do you ensure coverage and that you have everything you actually need to comply? We're going to talk about that, um, you know, uh, what, what the components of coverage are. First of all, education, obviously, uh, is paramount, and education about many, many things, but principally edu education about the requirements because our uh, one of our first principles is that you can only you can only comply at the granularity level of a requirement. So it stands to reason that if you don't know what the requirements are, then you're obviously wandering around the desert uh, dying of thirst because you obviously can't comply with something that you don't know, don't understand. So the, you know, compliance starts with an understanding of what each requirement is, and it should also follow logically, and it does if you look at uh, HHS's audit protocol, that you can only be audited based on the requirements that are in the rules. Right? They can't audit you uh, something that, that they make up. Right? So what's in an audit also should not be a mystery because it can only be based on what the requirements are. And if you look at HHS's audit protocol, it was no mysterious thing. They just took the requirements that were in the rules the whole time and said, translated them and created some spreadsheets and says, well, this is the universe of stuff that we can audit you on. And of course, we had done that uh, many years ago, you know, with for our security rule checklist, our privacy rule checklist, et cetera, because that's how you comply, the granularity level of a requirement. Okay, so we're going to talk about education requirements step by step, how you go about complying with each requirement, and therefore step by step how do you go? How do you go about preparing for an audit? Because they essentially are um, one and the same. Okay, and we're going to talk about the kind of methodology that you should use or have in place to be able to uh, do exactly that. So, learning objectives, comprehensive audit coverage. What does that mean? What's not comprehensive? Okay, the key components that we just talked about. Digging a little deeper. Uh, in, into those, why you need to track and how you track. We have scorecards that we provide, right? If you, it's the old adage that you can't manage what you don't measure. So how do you track the fact that you are complying with each requirements? Well, you've got to have some sort of tracking mechanisms that that allows you to do that. That you know, some sort of scorecard, okay? At at that granularity level, at that you know, so you can say yes, we're kind of we have something in place. No, this is just planned right now, okay? Uh, we know it exists, but we're, you know, we haven't implemented anything. Yes, we've implemented, we've implemented something, but it's basic. Yes, it's functional, but we've, had, we've implemented something, and it appears to be working. It's been working for about six months, and then you know, we have a, 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 I think the fourth category is like excellent. You know, uh, you're quite happy with the implementation. You've refined it several times for this requirement. Okay, so it, it's, it's a way to demonstrate that you're trying to comply at the granularity, uh, granularity level of requirement, and you can show, demonstrate that methodology that you're using to an auditor, to a court of law, to your management team, etc. Okay, so what is comprehensive? Well, first of all, 
you know, let's just go back to basics. There are the three rules that you got to comply with. The privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule. And each one of those needs to be broken down into its respective requirements. Okay? Now, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not as simple as just looking at the rule and say, and that, that you're going to find, oh, this is requirement one, this is requirement two, this is requirement three. It, it turns out that for the security rule, yeah, more or less is, uh, you can more or less treat each implementation specification uh, uh, in the security rule, and there's 29 of them, as the requirements of the security rule. Okay, and that's basically what we've done. That basically works for the security rule. The privacy rule really does not break down into standards and implementation specifications. In order to pull out the requirements of the privacy rule, we had to study the rules and actually abstract out what those requirements were. For the breach notification uh, rule, HHS has really treated its audit uh, protocol requirements. There's only, there are only 10. For, for the breach notification rule. So it, there's 169 that we established globally that, that you know, HHS first came out with. Only 10 of those were breach notification. And breach notification uh, is it's a pre preparedness set of requirements. You have model letters for patients. You have model letters for the media. You have model letters for HHS. You have a methodology for understanding when uh, breach notification is triggered. You have, you know, well, how do you, how do you uh, go through that three-step analytical process, et cetera, right? It's prepared requirements that make up the breach notification audit protocol. But in any case, each one of the three rules, it's definitely at the requirement level that you got to, you have to comply in. So therefore, you end up with a proximate total of about 169 requirements. Um, I think it, 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 I think 81 were in the security rule, and we have the numbers. 78 were in um, the privacy rule, and 10, you know, were, were in the breach notification rule. Now, in, in order to comprehensively comply, we think you need the following three things. Okay, not think we know. Okay, the, that you need it at a minimum the following three things per requirement. Okay, you need the policy that supports that requirement. You need the underlining, underlining organizational processes that underpin that policy for that requirement. And you need the ability to track process results. Okay, so let me give you my favorite example is training. So if I were an auditor and I would say, Mr. Privacy Officer, tell me about what's your training policy? Well, we train our, our, our entire workforce. Uh, obviously, when they come on board, uh, anytime the, there's a material change in the law, or we have our operational environment changes, merging, you know, we have merger and acquisition, or something that disturbed our, our uh, operational environment, that's our policy, okay? And refresher training at least once a year, okay? And I'm like, okay, I'm like, okay, that seems like a reasonable policy. So tell me about the processes you use to perform this training. Is it video-based? Is it classroom-based? Is there a task? What's the passing score? Okay, so that's a set of processes that you have all right, uh, that underpin your policy for training. And then I'm going to ask the $64 million question is, well, show me process results. Show me your training results. Show me the last time that Dr. Joe got trained, Nurse Jane got trained, the receptionist got trained. Show me what they got trained on, what date they were trained, you know, if there was a test, what, what their score was. In other words, I want to see evidence of training. If I don't see all three, then I'm going to say that you're not compliant, right? The most important thing to have, it's important to have the policy. Obviously, it's important to have the processes, right, in place, but it's equally important and imperative to have the ability to show visible, demonstrable evidence, essentially of all three, but especially of process results. So for each requirement, I want to see results. That's, that's the thing I'm most interested in. Yes, I'm interested in your policy, but a policy without underlying processes, it's just flowery language, right? Processes without uh, tracking mechanisms, well, okay, it sounds good. You, got, you, you, you describe this process, but how do I know that you're actually doing it, all right? Without, you, without your organization's ability to show me process results for this particular requirement, then I don't know and I can't say that you're compliant, okay? So it's no, it's no 
more complex or no, no more trivial than that, right? That, that, that's, the, that's the long and short of it right there, okay? So this is the key here. You, you must produce and track visible demonstrable evidence at, for each requirement. And again, it's, you know, the, 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 the main question that should come into your mind is, is, is your partner, we're assuming that you have some sort of partner, uh, vendor, somebody that's helping you, consultant, right? Can they show you what the, first of all, can they show you what all 169 requirements are? And then can they talk about what the policy should be and what the processes should be and what the tracking mechanism should be for that particular requirement, right? If not, then you probably have the wrong partner because that's, that's where you need to be, okay? So this is sort of a summary, right? You have, a, first of all, you have to begin with an understanding of the requirements. Then you have to be able to show VDE for each requirement. If you currently can't show VDE, you should at least show an auditor that you have a plan in place to achieve that, right? So HHS has understood from the beginning that that uh, the HIPAA rules are not like set and forget. There's something you're going to be complying or attempting to comply with over time, right? Where your good compliance narrative, your ability to demonstrate more and more over time, more and more rigorous, better, visible, demonstrable evidence is going to continue to improve as you go along this continuum to what you hope is full compliance. But because of the changing nature of the threat landscape, the law, etc., the full It appears we have lost Mr. Lay, but for the moment, he will be coming back in. What's, oh. I'm sorry, what's that? Uh, I, we lost your audio for a second. You're back now. Okay, so I was reviewing what, you know, what, what audit preparation means, okay, is audit preparation, you should be able to show visible demonstrable evidence for each requirement, or you must have, if, if you can't do that for each requirement, you've got to have a plan in place uh, to do that. Okay, so obviously it's all requirements. And when HHS first promulgated their version 1 of the audit protocol, uh, this is what they came up with for the privacy rule. These were all the requirements. Uh, for the security rule, these were the enumerated requirements. And here you can tell that they were broken down by um, the administrative safeguards, the um, technical safeguards, physical safeguards, etc. Uh, and then for the um, recertification rule, you had these 10 um, preparedness requirements. Okay? So this is where that total 169 comes from. Now, what they did their audit protocol version 2, they didn't really, they didn't, what they changed was they, they attempted to explain a lot more about what they wanted for each requirement. It was like more narrative, you know, more prose. You know, I, I guess maybe to a degree was somewhat helpful. If, on the other hand, it was somewhat confusing because their, their, their count changed a little bit, not by all that much. But now, now you have all this text that you had to deal with as well. Uh, but, you know, that was the sort of major change in protocol. It explained the protocol a little bit better. So we still like to say, you know, more or less, there's these 169 requirements that, that you have to comply with, right? And that's that's what you're going to get audited on. Right? And so there should be really a mystery of what you're going to get audited on. But what it just did was, and, and you can look at you can look at the you know the explanations about it just went through the rules and pulled out requirements, which is what everybody would do, which is what lawyers do. They go through the rules and they, they pull out the requirements, right? The, the, the challenge is, especially from an audit perspective, but just from a comprehensive perspective, is that there's all this mystery because there are so many partial solutions, okay? And partial solutions, you know, you, you may have some policies, some policies, some training, like that's something like Espresso that helps you with the risk assessment, and so on and so forth, right? And it creates a lot of confusion in the marketplace because you're not quite sure exactly which way to go. And one of the, one of the things that we want to get to here is just a basic understanding that what 
you should ground, what should ground you is how does this uh, partner help you um, help you comply with each requirement? Arnie, can you can you still hear me? Yes, okay. you are you are breaking up very badly though. The audio quality is very poor. Yeah, but that's true. You're going to have to pipe up and let me know when I'm in or out, obviously, because I don't know. So, can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you now, but you're still garbled. Now I can't hear you at all. Well, let's just give it a moment or two and see if we can reconnect. He's probably trying to dial back in. It happens sometimes, whether you're in Brazil or in the United States. Besides the questions that the, Oreo, uh, the audio is very badly, does anybody have any other questions at this point? Let's see if he gets back in. Yes, we were still on the audit preparation slide. Um, yes, it will be. Okay, I, I just tried to make a phone call to see if I can get a hold of Carlos, and um, the call did not go through. So they may be experiencing some technical difficulties lo locally. Um, I think uh, you know, we'll give it Okay, a Martin. Oh, I, you're I back. Called. You're back. Well, I've called into the audio. I've called oh, okay. into the audio. That's much better. All right. All right. I'm going. I'm going over. I'm, I've called into the audio, and then let me just start back here. With, you know, I think we were on wetware versus. And you're going to stay on mute, please, so because I when I ask you if you can hear me, I don't want to you have to mute and unmute every time. Okay. No, stay I wasn't. On, stay I was, unmuted. Yes. Okay, so let me let me uh, uh, move this over. Okay, so when we're talking about wetware versus software, we like to think you know at, at Free Lines, at least in part, the wetware is content that shows you how to comply, like our privacy rule checklists, our, our, our security rule checklists, our training. It's all about requirements. All our products try to address various aspects of requirements. You know, there's uh, there's HIPAA software out there, right? But if the HIPAA software is without content, there's a lot of HIPAA software out there that just functions as a repository for your documents. It's not really helping you comply. It's a way, it's a place to store stuff. Okay, and so you know, we like to think, we like to make this distinction between wetware and software, right? What what software is important? Espresso is a software product that allows you to do a risk assessment in three hours or less. Why can we say three hours or less? Because we pre-populated Espresso with 150 risks, matched threats with vulnerabilities, tied those to security rule controls, 
So we spent thousands of hours sort of framing the problem so that you could go in and address these 160 risks that actually implicate every single security rule control that you have to comply with. So, you know, Expresso is an example of software that has some wetware built in because it's showing you, demonstrating to you how you should comply. In, Carlos, in, in addition uh, to, yes. Um, your slides are, you're on, on that first slide preparing for HIPAA audit with Expresso, so you need to catch your slides up. I'm, no, I'm, I'm not, not, that's not what I'm looking at. Uh, I'm looking at partial solutions. What, where versus software, what are you seeing right now? Preparing for a HIPAA audit with Expresso. On the first slide? Uh, I'm just on the, getting the, the, the cover page. You're not seeing, you're not seeing, you're not seeing the slide? Uh, is everybody else, I'm not seeing the slide, is everybody else seeing the slides? No, 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 no one is seeing the slides, thank you. Well, you may have to make me presenter again then. Okay, let's try that. Uh, well, I've got your first on there. I mean, were you seeing the slides before? Yes. You got me first. What do you mean? Make me presenter again. Let's try that. Okay. I'm, I'm not seeing anything. So are you trying to make me presenter? I'm trying to. It's not allowing me to change the presenter. Well, take it back and make you the presenter, and then because it's already me, and then try switching it back. That's exactly what I'm trying to do, but I'm not having it. Okay, I see what why. Um, you're you're not in because you're on speaker or on your phone you don't have access to the slides okay so let me see if I what I can do on my side to fix this Well, we have, we have, uh, I mean, there people had the handout. The slides are in the handouts. Uh, yes, they are. So let's, let's just try to, you know, walk through it that way. I mean, because otherwise we're going to be fighting this technology. If everybody could kind of get to a place where it was wetware versus software uh, in the slides, in the handout. And then I, I explain, I'm just going to talk, we're going to have to fight through this because otherwise, um, you know, we're not going to make any progress. So uh, I apologize for the technical difficulties here. We usually don't experience that. It probably has somewhat to do that I'm in, in Brazil. Um, so I was talking about what compliance software should be. It ought to be much more than just a file repository, a place where you store your documents. It, it should actually help you manage your compliance initiative, right? And so you need this how-to uh, information built into the software or built into the training or built into the content and the collateral, okay, because we all know that the HIPAA rules are descriptive. They just tell you what. They don't tell you how. And even if you look at the NIST documents, the NIST documents, you know, for complying with the security rules, well, what they do is they play 20 questions. They say, well, for this particular requirement, here are the 20 questions you ought to be asking yourself. Well, that's not very helpful. Or even when you're, you just want to pull your hair out. They're not, they're not telling you how to comply, and they're never going to tell you how to comply because they're the U.S. government. They're, they're not going to tell you how to comply because then you can make the argument, well, we, we did it just the way you said, and now you're saying we're not in compliance. Okay? So no compliance regime is going to tell you how. They're going to tell you what. 
and then you have to figure out the how. Okay, and that's what you ought to be asking the questions of you, your partner: is how do you help me comply, and specifically, how do you help me comply with this 169 requirements? Now, some requirements, some are more important than others. Okay, and obviously, if you're talking about the HIPAA security rule, the very first requirement is the risk assessment. If you haven't done a comprehensive risk assessment, you're probably going to be found to be in willful neglect where the violations start at $50,000 per violation, okay? Because almost everything in the security rule is dependent on whether or not you've done a risk assessment, right? So you just can't, almost can't be in compliance without having done a risk assessment, okay? But even having said that, a risk assessment is one out of the 29 controls that you have to uh, implement in order to say that you are compliant with the, the security rule. So what are some of the other controls? Well, you have to be able to show that you are um, can track incidents, um, you know, that you're doing uh, reviewing log files, you know, that you have business associates agreements in place, that your business associates are doing the right thing, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these other sort of, you know, um, uh, disaster recovery, contingency planning, emergency operations. There's these other controls within the security rule that you need uh, to have implemented. Also training. What do you need to be trained on? Well, you need a lot more training nowadays than you used to. You need a lot more, your staff needs to be able to be a lot more literate as to the security rule than it did in the old days when we like to say, you know, that, that, that uh, what was offered was this sort of dumbed down feel good training. So you need, what do you need? Well, you need at a minimum for each workforce member training on the privacy rule, training on the breach notification rule, and training on the security rule. Okay? Those three things at a minimum. If you're the compliance officer, then you need audit training for each one of these. If you're, you know, we have specialty training like cloud, social media, mobile, you know, these are all, these are all training items depending on maybe what, what kind of staff you have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it, 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 the question is, is, is my training helping me comply with these 169 requirements? What are these tools that my partner has and are they helping me comply? So you can almost drive yourself to madness looking at the number of point solutions solutions that tackle a particular piece. And I'm not necessarily saying that a point solution is bad, but if you simply had a tool that helped you do risk assessment, then you're missing the other 28 controls within the security rule that you have to comply with. And, and we're not even talking about the breach notification rule or the privacy rule yet, right? So comprehensiveness means are you, um, are you sort of grounded in all these things that you need to comply, right? And I'm just going to enumerate sort of these high high end education requirements because all because the rules all change because of the High Tech Act. You should have at least some fundamental understanding of the High Tech Act because the High Tech Act was the game changer and introduced breach notification, etc. You should have some understanding about the om omnibus rule that was implemented in 2013 because it set some final rules. It changed some things vis-a-vis -vis the um, notification of privacy policy, vis-a-vis -vis breach of the business associate contract that you need to have. Of course, the privacy rule, the security rule, breach notification, business associates. These are all sort of major areas that would that would be comprehensive in nature from a training perspective, right? In addition, risk assessment, risk management social media, mobile, cloud computing, right? maybe some sort of certification that we're now um, uh, offering. So post the high tech act, right? You simply need more literacy. Now, does everybody in your workforce need to be trained on all these things? No. But does your compliance officer? Yes. Does some of the comp other compliance staff? Probably. You know, and so what we get to, what does everybody need? Well, everybody at a minimum should have the training on those three rules and probably depending on uh, what you do and what type of organization you are, you know, mobile is, is probably um, important, maybe important for everybody. Uh, cloud may
may be important for legal staff and some of your other executives. So there's a lot, it's a lot more nuanced now than it used to be. Okay, and, and that's why still this many years after the High Tech Act, there's still uh, a significant number of, um, there's still a significant amount of confusion around how you go about complying. Now, Mark, uh, Martin, I know we've had a hard time here, but I want to take a breath and see if there's any questions. Um, not, not at this time, Carlos. Okay, so I want to just sort of offer you how we at the Hippie Survival Guide uh, try to get at comprehensiveness, okay? We've taken the requirements and we map in our privacy room checklist, we have what we call a checklist item for every privacy rule requirement. And here you see PR, that's privacy rule, UD, that's uses, uses and disclosure, 0001, the first requirement of the privacy rule, violation of the rule, okay? And this item addresses whether or not you have a policy and a set of processes in place to determine when the privacy rule has been violated. If you can't determine when the privacy rule has been violated, then you'll never be able to determine when breach notification is triggered. Why is that? Because breach notification requires a violation of the privacy rule, okay? This is like a compliant, HIPAA Compliance 101, but it's more nuanced and it's apparent on its face. If you want to sanction employees for violating the privacy rule, then you need to have a consistent methodology for determining when the privacy rule was violated, okay? Well, in our breach notification framework, we give you that methodology, and in, in our checklist, we tell you what kind of policy you should have with respect to violation of the rule, what sort of processes you should have in place, and how you track this, okay? And then we go to the next requirement for uses and disclosure. So with respect to the privacy rule, we've broken the privacy rule down into three areas. Uses and disclosures, what you can and can't do, okay, vis-a-vis -vis disclosure, and then what we call the, the patient's bill of rights. Notice the privacy practices, the fact that a patient can demand, demand access to their PHI, the fact that a patient can demand that they modify their PHI, and then finally administrative requirements. We saw the document documentation that you need to have, okay? And for each one of those things, we're not showing that right now, but for each one of those things, we tell you what the policy ought to be, we tell you what processes you should implement, and we tell you how you ought to go about tracking this particular requirement, okay? And PBR, here you see the sections for the patient's bill of rights, and here you see the administrative requirements, okay? And so that is how we look at the world how we provide the house and information. So if you were asked me, Carlos, if I, you know, if I partner with you guys, how do you help me ensure that I have coverage for every single one of the requirements? And I say, well, it all starts with our checklist, and then I tell you how we how you use our other tools and templates to comply with other parts of it. But the checklist actually show you on a, at a requirement by requirement um, level what you should be doing, the how to. Okay, and so the same thing. And for the security rule, we've broken it down into its natural breakdown of the administrative slate safeguards. Um, Martin, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so for the, for the security rule, we've broken it down into uh, the administrative safeguard, zero, zero, requirement 001A, zero, zero, uh, for a risk assessment, a risk assessment, let me back up, a risk assessment is one implementation specification of the 29 that you need to comply with in the security rule. But when it comes to our checklist, we've broken that down, the risk assessment down into seven steps, okay? Because those are the seven steps that NIST says you should implement. Uh, that's the NIST methodology for conducting the risk assessment, and that's essentially what we implemented with Espresso. We took that NIST seven-step methodology and we productized it. But in our checklist, that one implementation specification, we give you nine checklist items because that risk assessment, the risk assessment is a really, really complex requirement. And so we broke it down into a, a series of sub-requirements. Same thing is for risk uh, mitigation. That's Hello. Uh, those two implementations. Quick yes. question, what what slide are you on for those of, of following along? 
Yeah, I'm, 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 I don't have a slide number. I'm sorry, guys. I, I have requirements. At the top, it should say requirements, parentheses, XR of the security rules. Requirements, open parentheses, SR, close parens for the security rule. I don't have a slide number here. I mean, I could get one, but I'd have to ex exit out here. Okay. Okay, we're we're good to go, I think. Okay, so um, so the check that's how the checklist functions. The checklist is, is are actually the glue and the scorecard. So we have these things called scorecards that tie to our checklist items and that tie to the requirements. Okay, and if, if, if you assemble these three pieces, here are the requirements of the rules. In the middle is how you keep count with our scorecard, and to the right of that would be a visual of here are all the checklist items, and the checklist item is a, a, uh, a re essentially a requirement, but it could be broken down into seven or eight sub-requirements depending on the complexity, right? So with those three pieces, we can ensure that you have coverage. We can walk down the scorecard and say, well, are you doing this? Well, if you're not doing it, go go to the security rule checklist, find that checklist item, and read what you should be doing and how you should be doing it, okay? And once you implement it, then you can give yourself a score, right? And that, that becomes then the methodology that helps you triangulate and put all these pieces together. Now, what, what, I'm, what I'm suggesting to you is any partner that you have should be able to have some sort of methodology and way that they can show you how they're helping you achieve coverage. Okay, that's that's the important thing. Now I've moved on to the requirements for breach notification, which is those ten requirements that we talked about. It is their preparedness requirements, and those are met by our breach notification framework. So we have a security rule checklist that has all the security rule requirements. We have a privacy rule checklist that has all the privacy rule requirements, the how-to. We have a breach notification framework. What does it have? Well, it has a methodology to show you when notification is triggered. So if an auditor says, well, how do you know when notification is triggered? You say, well, we, we have this analytical framework. That analytical framework comes right out of the rules. I can tell you what the three steps are right now. Uh, often we do an entire webinar on just breach notification, but the first step was, was PHI, uh, was unsecured PHI compromised? Okay, and essentially what that's saying is, was there a privacy rule violation? Okay, and then that gets back to saying, well, how do you answer that question? Was there, was there a privacy rule violation? Well, we give you a methodology for walking through the privacy rule to determine whether or not it was violated of unsecured PHI. Well, what does that mean? Well, unsecured PHI means PHI that hasn't been rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable. In other words, PHI that you haven't encrypted. Because if you've encrypted the PHI according to the protocol, you really can't have a breach by definition. Okay? But for the purposes of this webinar, a breach notification framework helps satisfy those 10 requirements of HHS's audit protocol with respect to breach notification, which is you have a methodology in place, you understand when notification is required, you understand that notification it requires specific content. You just can't say any old thing when you notify a patient or the media. The regulations say you have to at least say these things. You have to at least put in a white 1-800 number if you know, so many patients were impacted, right? There's some rules around how you go about notifying, and the question is, from an audit perspective, are you prepared? If you had a breach today, would you be prepared? You have model letters, you have a methodology, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so that's, that's how uh, HHS would audit you on the breach notification rule, okay? So one of the questions is, that you would want to answer is, would you know a breach if you saw one? How do you know? Right? So my first question would be, one of the first questions I would ask when I'm auditing is, tell me about how you're tracking security incidents. Because if you, and if you get that deer in the headlights look, then I know that uh, 
uh, you're probably done for, right? Because if you're not tracking security incidents, how do you know when there's a breach? If people don't know who, how to report a breach to a particular individual or group, then how are you ever going to uh, find out that, that, that there was a breach except by some kind of dumb luck, right? And then, then the questions from there go, okay, well, you have a, you, okay, so there is a person that you call and everybody knows it, you know, they know the number of this person or the group. When that group gets an incident, what do they do? How do they go about analyzing to create an incident document, you know, et cetera, et cetera. That's the kind of preparedness requirements that would that, that are contained in those 10, right? So that those are the kind of questions if I were auditing, that's what I would ask about is, hey, tell me first how do you track because that leads to everything else, okay? What I'm showing now is I'm showing a slide that says step by step, open parens PR for privacy rule. And this is just a, an example of one checklist item. And what I wanted to show here is that a checklist item, this happens to be privacy rule dash uses and disclosure dash 0001 violation of the rule. Okay, and what it is that we're giving you, we're giving you a policy statement. So if you take all these policy statements for every checklist item, and we have, right, we take that and we put it into one policy document, that becomes your privacy rule policy. Now, obviously, it's a model policy. So you would take that and modify it a little bit. But once you've modified it a little bit and distributed it and got everybody to sign, that's a ticky mark. You can say, you know, everybody understands our, our privacy rule policy because we reviewed it, we distributed it, everybody signed it. That, that, that signature is in their personnel, their HIPAA workforce folder, ticky mark, you've met that. So I'm showing you that we have a description of the checklist item, we have references to the law, but the three principal things is we have policy statements. And then we have, we're telling you a set of processes that you should implement and how you should track this particular requirement, right? At that level of granularity, we're giving you the how-to. And then this, this uh, M1234, that actually goes into our scorecard, which is an Excel spreadsheet that you're grading yourself. Hey, the zero means you're not doing anything at all, which is bad. One means, yeah, we understand that we should be doing something. We have a plan, but we don't have it in place. Two means we have something in place, not as good as we would want it, you know, so we give ourselves a score of two for basic and so forth. And at the end of the day, you know, this is something that you use to grade yourself. It's also something you could use to a show a court of law that you're doing what's reasonable and appropriate for an organization of your size complexity, amount of resources, etc. In other words, it shows it's evidence of compliance. It's evidence of compliance. The scorecard is how you demonstrate that you have a methodology in place for covering all 169 requirements. Okay, and here's an example of step-by-step -step open parent security rule. Again, example of one checklist item of the probably in a security rule uh, because, because some like risk, risk, uh, risk assessment was broken down into seven checklist items because it was a big requirement. Uh, it's, it's more than 29, and, but not as many as 81, all right? So it, 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 don't get overly concerned that, the, that the, 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 the counts don't match exactly because HHS has sometimes included some subparts as requirements, sometimes not, you know, but We've done the mapping that we feel like we, we got this covered, right? Even though even though the exact numbers uh, don't line up, because we've gone methodically gone through and say, yep, okay, this covers these two or three over here, and these cover these, etc. Right? So here's an example of step by step breach notification. You know, in from our breach notification framework, showing well, how do you know? How do you know if you've encrypted correctly? Well, before you say, do I know that I encrypted correctly? You have to say, well, was the PSI in motion? Was it at rest? Was it at rest? Were you trying to dispose of it? And then, did you use the correct protocols for for doing that? Okay, so you got to get to a place where you're getting not descriptive because that's what that's the what that's what's in the rules. Your partner or partners have to be 
providing you this step-by-step -step stuff, right? Prescriptions, the how-to for all that cover all 169. If you if you hope to be prepared for a for an audit or for uh, a lawsuit, God forbid that that should happen, right? Because you had this major breach. So being able to show that it, you at least had these things in place, even though you weren't in perfect compliance. It's probably, in most cases, enough to get you out of a willful neglect finding. Because willful neglect essentially means you stuck your head in the sand and you didn't do anything. I think about two or three weeks ago there was a breach. Essentially, the organization hadn't done anything since the High Tech Act was promulgated in 2009, and they got whacked with a $3.4 million fine, right? Which is what you're going to get whacked with if you pull down that three ring binder of how you used to comply before you know, before OCR really was ever really enforcing HIPAA because prior to the High Tech Act, HIPAA was really a paper tiger that never got enforced. Okay, so that's how big a change the High Tech Act is. HIPAA now is teeth. Those teeth started growing in 2009. Those teeth started maturing in 2013 with the omnibus rule. Those teeth are fully grown now and are fighting pretty hard you know, seven years after the High Tech Act right, has been promulgated, right? So if, if you look at these slides and these scorecards, this is our methodology for providing you um, coverage, okay? And we uh, like to say that we have it. And, but I was going to say we have a question while you're on policies. How many HIPAA policies should a company have on average? Okay, so we don't like this approach of having, like, 50 policies for the privacy rule. We take all the privacy rule policy requirements, um, policy statements, and we put it into one policy for the privacy rule. And that's a comprehensive policy for the privacy rule. We have one policy for the security rule, comprehensive that covers all the requirements. One policy for the breach notification rule, okay? Then we have other sub-policies that really relate to these rules, like, for example, we have a social media policy, model policy. We have a cloud model policy, and it depends on what the organization does, whether you're a covered entity, what kind of covered entity, or you're a business associate, what kind of business associate, how many policies you're going to have. But we're not, we're not, you know, I mean, having hundreds of policies with some of our competitors have, we don't think that makes any sense. It's like, what, why do you have all these hundreds of documents? And a, and a lot of it is boilerplate, right? So we, we took a different approach. We have one comprehensive policy for the privacy one for the breach notification rule, one for uh, the security rule, and then some other policies that uh, are used depending on the need. Martin, are you still there? Yes, I am. That was the only question we've had so far, and it was a good one. Okay, so we're on by agile versus heavyweight um, methodology. Uh, you know, we like to think of our methodology as being agile. We, we allow you to get started really, really quick with our, our model tools. Like, for example, you can we have model policies for you. You can look at those policies. They're comprehensive in nature. You can tweak them a little bit to your organization. Now you have a, a, a privacy rule policy that you can distribute and get signed. You have a security rule policy that can distribute, you can distribute and get signed. We have 15 different training models where you can quickly demonstrate the HHS or a court of law that you've, got, you've gotten your people trained. But the important thing is that you get started. And you get started and you start looking at the scorecard, looking at the checklist and seeing, first of all, acquiring an understanding of the requirements because how, you, how are you going to comply with something you don't even understand, right? So that's one. That's, that's 101, basic. Do you understand the requirements? Well, we give you a way to understand it. Right, because we track it at we track it at that level, and then as you start to sort of grade yourself and go through the scorecard and look at some of our model policies, you do enough of that and do and go through our training sessions. You do you 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 do enough homework, or the light starts to come on as to how our methodology fits together, how these pieces of the puzzle give you coverage of all 169 requirements. But you can't eat this elephant at one time. You have to eat it a little bit at a time, right? It's overwhelming to try to eat it at, at one time, right? And so we
we give you easy ways to get started. Like we have 20 mini project plans, for example. That's a way to get you started. Just get going doing something. Distribute your policies. Get people trained. Create a HIPAA repository that's going to have where you store all your documents. So, you know, we, these mini, mini project plans are a program for achieving compliance, right? But the important thing is an agile versus heavyweight is, Look, get start get started because every every organization is going to implement HIPAA a little bit different because every organization's culture is a little different. Okay, this is not going to be it's not going to be the same implementation over and over again. It's going to vary uh, by organization. So um, I want to skip forward here to um, you know one of our, our philosophical arguments. Uh, and because of technical problems, I'm, I'm trying to get through this, is big problems like HIPAA compliance require many, many small solutions. It may be counterintuitive, but you're, you're going to iterate your way through uh, trying to achieve the aspirational goal of full compliance by implementing, you know, and learning as you go. Okay? And HHS expects that. In fact, HHS would be happy find that you had a methodology and a way of understanding all 169 requirements, even if you hadn't gotten to implementing all 169 requirements, because at a minimum you show that you have a methodology and a problem-solving approach that eventually should get you close to the aspirational goal of full compliance, right? And so if you have these things in place, you're unlikely to be whacked with a, uh, a finding of a willful neglect. But on the other hand, you could buy some tools and some methodologies and not not do your first risk assessment, um, and then you probably would be found to be willful neglect of the security rule because uh, what Espresso does. I'm going to try to get to the uh, Espresso slides here um, and skip some of this other stuff to talk about what um, what we've tried to do with. Espresso. Okay, so we call it Espresso, the risk assessment express, and this comes, it's a software as a service application. We we've we predefined and pre-combined threats with vulnerabilities to create risks. And it's your our customer's job to go through these risks and assign levels of probability. What's the probability that this threat it's going to exploit this vulnerability, and if that threat exploiting this vulnerability, what would be the impact to your organization? Okay, and then you give that a value, high, medium, or low. So you say the probability of this threat, let's say software engineering or intrusion, fishing. The probability of this threat exploiting the fact that we have no no disaster recovery plan, um, well, is high. Right? If you have if you have no disaster recovery plan, then social engineering, uh, the probability that some social engineering scheme could exploit that vulnerability is probably high. Right? And if somebody got into your network and exploited the fact that you didn't have any disaster recovery plan uh, and actually caused a disaster like Katrina, well, what would be the impact to your organization? Well, the impact to your organization is likely to be catastrophic, so the impact is going to be high, then you take those two probabilities and you come up with a probability for the risk, high, medium, or low. Okay? Now, HHS understands that this is subjective. It's not a mathematical approach. It's you thinking hard about your organization and assigning a risk level, an impact level, a probability level that this threat will exploit this vulnerability. Now, what we've done is we've come up with 160 risks, and those risks cover the entirety of the security rule. So, for example, we've taken this, uh, uh, a security rule control is the same, is implement, an implementation specification is an old term of art. What they're called now in, in the cybersecurity world, universes, are controls, okay? And so a vulnerability is the absence of a control. So let me show you how that works. The security rule says that you've got to have a disaster recovery plan. Okay? If you don't
don't have a disaster recovery plan, no disaster recovery plan becomes the vulnerability. That, that vulnerability is the absence, the ab absence of the control. Okay? And that's the approach that we took. That's how we, we were able to say from a mathematical perspective that Espresso produces a valid security rule risk assessment by definition. It identifies uh, over and over again somewhat, right, it, 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 because, because a threat can exploit multiple vulnerabilities, but it identifies all 29 security rule controls that you have to implement to say that you're in compliance with the security rule. Once you've done and gone through those 160 requirements that we've created for you, we've matched up for you, you produce this master risk assessment report, and you've identified those things, those risks as high, medium, or low, now you have the list of things that you have to go implement. Maybe you already had a disaster recovery plan in place. And so that threat of no disaster recovery plan, you know, the, the, uh, the probability of that threat exploiting vulnerability is probably low if you already had a pretty rigorous plan in place, all right? And so you would score that risk different depending on what you had in place, but you would, from this process, identify what those things are that you have to remediate, okay? And so the reason that we say that you can do a risk assessment three hours or less is, A, is that we spent the thousands of hours setting up the framework, creating the wetware, so that all you would have to do is go through those 169 risks and produce this report. Is that all the risks you're ever going to have? No. This is an iterative thing. So Espresso allows you to do as many risk assessments as you want over time. And you can go back in time and produce a risk assessment from two years ago and produce that report. And you can go back in time after you remediate and change a risk from high to low because now you put in the control, right? So it, 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 it's a place that can change that how-to information um, that sets the stage for the remainder of your security rule implementation, okay, which is the, really the hard part comes in the remediation is, okay, we've identified all these risks. Which of, which of these controls are we, going, are we going to attack given the amount of resources that we have during this iteration? It assumes that you're going to have multiple iterations, and we like to think that you, at a minimum, not like to think this is what we recommend, at a minimum you should be doing a risk assessment once a year. And really, if you're really serious about um, keeping up with the threat landscape, we really think once a quarter is really the minimum because that's how fast the threat landscape is doing, okay? But Espresso will allow you to do multiple risk assessments and, and will allow you to track your improvement over time of the, the controls that you've implemented, okay? And so uh, that's sort of the magic of, of what Espresso does, and it doesn't require you to have your entire inventory. In fact, it doesn't require you to have any inventory of security objects in place. And what, what are security objects? Security objects are things that you apply controls to, okay? Places, persons, and things. But specifically, it, 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 you can think of it as a, kind of, a, of, a, as of a kind of inventory, but it's much broader than that, right? You, yes, you apply controls to phones, PCs, servers, pads, networks, things like that. Okay? But you also apply security controls to your workforce. You also apply them to processes. You also apply them to buildings, to physical rooms, and things like that. So it's bigger than what people used to think as inventory, hard hardware, right? Physical things. If so instead of using inventory, we 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 coined the term security objects because security objects are what you apply security controls to. But Espresso doesn't require you to go through this long, arduous process of putting in all your inventory into Espresso before you can do your first risk assessment. Why? Why is that not a requirement? First of all, it's not a requirement in the law. Okay. Second of all, we we feel as from a fit, uh, philosophical philosophical perspective, from a methodology perspective, it's more important to be applying controls in the real world to real world objects and to document the fact that you brought in all your real-world objects into a software program, right? Because some, uh, some um, uh, security objects, some controls, 
like disaster recovery applied to all, every single one of the security objects you have, a disaster recovery plan applies to, right? So what we believe is you ought to be implementing those controls in the real world, patching your server, patching your servers, you know, doing all these things in the physical world, and yes, eventually to get a more rigorous risk assessment, right, and document the fact that you've applied it to these controls, you're going to want to bring in your inventory. But to to wait on doing a risk assessment until you have all your security objects in place is like the cart before the horse. It's not a requirement. In fact, it's slowing you down. It's not helping you. It's hurting you. Okay, and we know that some of our competitors. And even the even the uh, uh, risk assessment tool from HHS, which is really was terrible to start with, required this sort of inventory thing. Is like you know the first step, which is which is nonsense. The law doesn't really require that, right? The law requires it that you do it in the real world. Okay, uh, yes, you know. So it's not a question of doing getting you know the a, a the best grade on a risk assessment, which you know from from a a uh, even if it were grading, I think you'd get a an A or an A plus out of expressive is it's identifying those 29 controls that at a minimum you've got to implement to comply with the security rule. Now we think those 29 controls, that's cybersecurity 101. That's compliance, right? Is that everything to keep bad guys out of your network or away from your PHI? No. But that's what the law requires, right? And let's at least start there as a foundational thing uh, and then move on. Okay, so so the magic of Espresso is that we've done the heavy lifting so that you guys can focus on those specific requirements and identifying high, medium, or low, and then getting to the remediation step faster than you otherwise would. Okay? And then you can come back and you can apply controls to anywhere in the tree. Like we have a, a we have, you can apply a security control to every security object, you can apply it to a category of objects like devices. So we have a preset of classification that we give you, right? We have devices, and under devices we have PCs, phones, blah, 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 and classes, and all the way down to the single object. And you can apply a control anywhere up and down the tree. So we've done the wetware to allow you to actually document all where, where you've applied control in the real world, uh, within Espresso, we just don't force you to do that before you actually get started in the real world remediate. Okay, um, so I'm going to take another breath there, Martin, and just um, sort of throw it out there for uh, questions. Okay, well, we don't have any at this time. Um. Well, that 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 that, um, that doesn't surprise me. You know, because we often uh, we don't have the People are looking at the slides, but let me talk a little bit more about. Uh, we just released. Espresso has been, uh, well, you know, uh, in production now. Uh, I think since uh, it was August 2016, correct? Uh, yes. We've had many, many customers go through their first risk assessment in a short uh, period of time. We released Espresso 1.1 that uh, provided some very needed enhancements. For example, keeping notes allows you to keep notes for each risk. You know, uh, and uh, notes for each security object that you put into the system and it allows you to implement obviously we don't you know we give you 160 risks but we allow you to put in your own risk and that's you know over time right well what we've done is pre-populated uh, so that you're not staring at that blank sheet of paper and if anybody's tried to create a risk assessment and and looked at the NIST methodology so one thing you should know is that, that what Espresso does is implement uh, NIST Special Publication 800-30, Rev. 1, right? That's the NIST methodology for conducting a risk assessment. What Espresso did was essentially productize that, okay? And Espresso is part of our subscription plan. So when you buy our subscription, okay, not only do you get Espresso, you get our 15 training modules, you get all our checklists, you, you get uh, the other tools and templates, uh, that we provide, so it's really Espresso Plus, these 30 odd products that help you remediate, right, and that are growing over time. About six weeks ago, we delivered a contingency framework that helps you create a disaster recovery plan. So if you don't have a plan in place, you're not staring at this blank sheet of paper. So the pricing on its, on, on the subscription that includes Espresso is $2,500. You get all that, plus you get 
get any new products, any enhancements to the product. Like back in 2013, uh, we had to change our products to the omnibus rule, right? The people that were subscribing didn't get charged anymore. We had to go change all our products. Every last single one of them, training ones, the, the omnibus rule impact, impacted all of it. Our subscribers just got that, right? Any new products that we added, uh, our subscribers just got that. So. It, that $2,500 is a complete package. We think a comprehensive package, uh, not a partial solution, a nearly complete solution. Um, and it's getting more complete over time. Too. We're adding things to it. And then year two, year three, it's an optional renewal of $1,295. I mean, obviously, if, if you want to continue to do more risk assessments and have access to Espresso, then, you know, you, you have to uh, pay the renewal price, right? But that's, that's, uh, that's what you get, and you continue to get any updates, new products, enhancements to products, uh, et cetera. So I apologize uh, for the technical difficulties. I'm glad that I was able to dial in and, and kind of get through this. Uh, happy to take some questions after the fact. Uh, if anybody wants to have a you know sort of one-on-one -on -one or a couple people in your organization where you want us to sort of demo Espresso, we can do that. Martin. Uh, you should also, if you go to store.hippasurvivalguide.com and you go under the videos tab, there's an hour-long session of an espresso demo with public Q&A. So I would, uh, if you'd like to learn more, that's one place you can start. You know, we're, we did it in front of the public. We took questions. Uh, if you want more information or a more personalized demo, we can also work with you. Uh, to get that done. If there's no uh, questions, I want to thank you for participating, hanging in there with us, and uh, my, my apologies for our, our technical difficulties. We do have a question. Okay. The question is about PHI. My company has a policy that no PHI is allowed to be in the subject or body of an email, not even the initials of the participant unless the email is encrypted. We contract with a company that sends us automatic, automated emails about the installation of their service. But all these emails include our particip participants' full names. These emails are not, a, not encrypted. Isn't this a HIPAA violation? They suggested using truncated version of the name. Is that allowed? No, it's not a per se. It's not a per se uh, violation. Okay, it's obviously not recommended. You're not you're not taking advantage of the breach notification safe harbor. You're sending PHI over, you know, in clear text over the wire. Right? It's not a smart thing to do. Any sniffer could pick that up. But is it per se just the fact that you sent it? No, because it turns out that the encryption is an addressable requirement of the security rule not a required requirement, right? So there's two categories of requirements, of standards, not requirements, let's say standards, okay? And standards under the screw will have implementation specifications, controls. Some controls are required, some controls are what uh, HHS designated as addressable. It's unfortunate that they're called addressable because it doesn't mean that you can ignore them what it means is implement the implementation specification act is implement an alternative or document provide us a compelling reason why you chose not to do anything with respect to this security rule control. Well, essentially why you you decided to ignore the control. Well, encryption is one of those things that is flexible. And so HHS has said, and this is consistent with the rule, that you can be in compliance with uh, the security rule and not not be encrypted. Okay, you're not going to get banned. You're not going to take advantage of the safe harbor. And if you had a breach, you're going to get whacked, right? And you're probably going to get whacked because courts are starting to say that the security the security rule mandates that you do what is reasonable and appropriate. More and more, what is reasonable and appropriate means encrypting. Okay, so you know it, it, those are the weasel words that even though encryption is an addressable requirement, so you're not per se in violation of the rule, if you actually had a breach, a court of law, maybe even HHS, would find that what you did was not reasonable and appropriate, and they would still get you. So 
you know, the answer is it depends, but no, it's not a it's not a per se violation to send that in clear text. Obviously, you want you want you want that practice to stop. It's not a good practice, but it's not a the the fact that that just happens, just the event itself is not a per se violation. That's all we have. All right. Well, uh, I just want to thank you guys for hanging in there with us. Uh, please, uh, you know, throw any questions that we weren't able to address or that you can think of our way, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you.